This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Welcome to another TARDIS destroying, Gallifrey summoning edition of Defending the Despised, the ongoing series where I take a second look at some of the most controversial and disliked parts of the Doctor universe. This time we're stepping into the Immortality Gate to see if the 10th Doctor's last hurrah is unfairly judged. And yes, I know what you're thinking, the end of time can't possibly be hated, I love it. Indeed, it came at a respectable 82nd out of 241 stories in a 2014 Doctor Who magazine poll, but it seems that whenever this story is brought up, a lot of fans wrinkle their noses and dismiss it for having a negative view on regeneration, along with a lot of badly handled aspects like the Master being Skeletor. Despite bidding farewell to the most popular Doctor of the last 30 years, there is a surprising amount of dislike for the story, so I thought I might take another look at it and see whether this unfortunate reputation is actually quite unfair, given how much the two-parter had to do in order to wrap up half a decade of Doctor Who in a satisfying and modern way. So without any further ado, grab your Rassilon gauntlet and let's defend the end of time. It can be a bit hard balancing a life like this, where you make 20 to 30 minute videos each and every week, but as long as you have the right help, you can really improve your output as a creative person. The kind of help you can find on… Skillshare. Skillshare is an online service with thousands of classes, from photography to graphic design, creative writing to painting, and all sorts in between. There are no ads and plenty of original, premium classes tailored to fit any kind of schedule, so you can always find ways to grow both professionally and personally. Want to get better at your hobby? Skillshare is a class for you. Want to dip into a brand new hobby you know nothing about? Skillshare still has you covered, connecting you with a community of millions of other passionate creators just like yourself. Recently, I've been struggling with my productivity, but I found Thomas Frank's class on the topic incredibly helpful, to the extent that it helped me make two Series 5 videos in one week. And yes, you heard that right, Series 5 reviews are coming soon. It's a really handy class, taking you step by step through the best ways to optimise your personal workspace and make the most out of your talents, so I seriously recommend it. You can access this class and thousands more by joining Skillshare today, and if you're quick enough, the first 1000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a 1 month trial completely free so that you can explore your creativity today. So a massive thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and let's get on with this bumper edition of Defending the despised. This should be spectacular. One of the last things we saw on Waters of Mars was Ood Sigma standing ominously in the snow. Therefore, it only makes sense to pick that up with the Doctor returning to Ood Sphere to find out why. But of course, because this is a Doctor, there are about 10 books, 20 audios, a multimedia event, and a whole future episode all tucked away in the meantime. You know how it is. I do think it's very in character that he takes this detour though. Remember, this is the Doctor, a character who runs. I mean, it's how they got a TARDIS in the first place. And based on the prophecy from Planet of the Ood, he knows his time is running out. I think your song must end soon. If you're going to die, you're going to want to delay it as much as possible, so I don't think you can blame him there. I love this chilling seance scene so much, introducing all the major players of the story, along with establishing the inevitable survival of the Master, whose deaths are about as permanent as any Stephen Moffat companion. It's a wonderful link back to that earlier story, continuing the narrative cohesion of the Davis era. Everything links, everything has its place, every story progresses something, whether that be character journeys, series arcs, or even this the ultimate arc. It really makes it feel powerful and intense as the Doctor races back to the TARDIS. This is how you begin a big special like this. The Doctor is racing against time itself, against his inevitable death. This inevitable death forms the backbone of the special, shown with a simple four word sentence. I'm going to die. Obviously, the Doctor still remembers Carmen's prophecy from Planet of the Dead, so he knows time is up. A lot of people take issue with him claiming regeneration feels like dying, with a new man sauntering away. I honestly don't know why they get so up in arms about it. It's important to remember that this is the 10th Doctor saying this. If it was any other, it would feel wrong. But the thing is, this Doctor has always been full of guilt and anguish, constantly carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. It's therefore no surprise that he views regeneration in a negative light. And besides, he's not even wrong. Regeneration isn't a pleasant thing. When you really look at it, everything about a Time Lord does die. 
their face and their personality disappears, with only the memories remaining. I've always found it a refreshing take on the regeneration concept. The Ninth Doctor wasn't exactly accurate when he explained it as sheet and death because it isn't. They still die, it just resurrects them in a different vessel. It's more existential than a lot of fans give it credit for, so I just think it's a nice new perspective. And yes, I know the complaint that Tim phrasing it this way makes it harder for the next Doctor to replace him, but I don't think it made the changeover any more challenging than it already was. Since even without this line, Smith and Moffat faced an uphill battle. The line is simply a way to gratify the audience. It's a touching moment of clarity for this incarnation as he grapples with his impending death. There's nothing mean-spirited about it, it's just there to show his identity crisis to set the stage for the story, making the stakes higher because regeneration isn't a safety buffer. It has permanent consequences, although he can still jump from a spaceship without dying, for some reason. There's a very strong scene with Wilf exploring the Doctor facing his death, the pair connecting on a character level. I'd be proud. Of what? If you were my dad. It continues the misdirection of Carmen's prophecy, making it seem unquestionable that the Master kills the Doctor, which ultimately makes the ending even more heartbreaking, since it's actually Wilf who knocks and causes the death, despite not meaning to. It also makes sense for Wilf to tell the Doctor to kill the Master first, because if he does, that restores the entire human race. This makes the Doctor realise just how many lives he has already taken, especially the lives lost in his own name. Like Davros pointed out, the Doctor has created warriors, scores of people taking their own lives for the Doctor's cause, and that's more horrifying than any murderer, because he knows exactly what he's doing, he always has. Like so many scenes in this story, this is a strong character moment, where we can understand just how much responsibility this incarnation bears. It justifies his existential crisis because he now realises the length of a timeless life can be a brutal curse, potentially explaining why there are no other Time Lords as old yet kind and heroic as the Doctor, eventually because they all get corrupted by this insane power, just like he did at the end of Waters of Mars. So it's a really serious moment of self-reflection for the Doctor, starting to accept his illumined death because he wants a clean slate to remedy all the mistakes he made in this incarnation. However, for all the negatives in the story, Wilfred Mott is there to counteract them. It goes without saying that Wilf is one of the best things Doctor Who has ever produced. He's our lovable space granddad with his unwavering support, so I adore the scene of him sneaking out of his iconic antlers in search of the Doctor. This sequence is pure Russell T Davis through and through. It's something you don't think about, but it makes perfect sense. Unit can have all their satellites and surveillance networks, but nothing beats the amount of gossip old people partake in, so it's a brilliant touch for explaining how they actually find this elusive Time Lord so quickly. It shows that focus on humanity Davis always included, and I will admit it's a fun scene as all the pensioners fangirl over the Doctor, even if Minnie sexually assaults him. Yeah, that's not okay. Really, it's just a means to an end. You need an explanation of how the Doctor and Wolf cross paths again, but it has to be more compelling than the Doctor simply appearing in front of him, so I think this does a good job of bringing these characters together. And the Doctor even calls out the coincidence. No, but people have waited hundreds of years to find me and then you manage it in a couple of hours. I wasn't a fan of the whole destiny and fate aspect of the Doctor and Donna's relationship, so I don't like that Davis doubles down on it with Wilf, although at least this one is justified better because that mysterious woman keeps cropping up in Wilf's life, so you can imagine she's part of what keeps pulling them together. Speaking of Donna, Wilf wants the Doctor to fix her, although this mime wipe later conveniently plays into the plot because she unknowingly helps the protagonist by buying Naismith's books thanks to the Convergence. Handy that, at least it gives us this iconic moment. Are you shouting at thin air? Yes. Later, the Master tries to kill her and it's hard to imagine what Donna is feeling. Suddenly, everyone around her has become this complete stranger. Her mother, her fiancé, they're all the exact same person, and she doesn't understand because of the mind wipe, which is now starting to burn her up just like the Doctor warned. It's simply daunting. However, I do find it weird that the Doctor claims to have given her a defence mechanism. Defence against what? A group of transformed masters trying to kill her? Seems oddly specific. I mean, what if she was driving past a blue box and started remembering her adventures? Would she just wipe out everyone around her? It's quite weird and reeks of a hand-wavy explanation to try and justify Donna being in the story without contradicting that earlier plot point. I do understand Davis's dilemma though. You have a big story with Wolf as the main companion, so it would be impossible to not include Donna in some way. Did I miss something? Again? 
I think they do it well though, using her so the Doctor can reflect on his loneliness, because he has consistently refused the opportunity to take on another companion after losing Donna. It's moments like these that remind you of how human this incarnation is with his vulnerable core. It's just a touching moment injecting a lot of personality into the story. It's not just a movie-like battle for the universe. It's a very character-oriented narrative, and these kinds of scenes build those personal stakes. Now you take this, that's an order, Doctor. Take the gun. You take the gun and save your life. Wilf is simply the perfect companion for this story with wonderful reactions to everything. Bigger on the inside. Do you like it? I, I thought it'd be cleaner. He's the human heart of the two-parter, this awestruck fan of the Doctor who finally gets to go on an adventure, even getting to go on a spaceship. This is a character who has spent years dreaming of being in space. He has looked up to the stars night after night, imagining what it's like, so you just can't help but relate to how stunned he is at seeing the Earth from above. It's something so few people have had the privilege to see. I think we'd all be frozen in awe if we were in his position. <laughs> I'm an astronaut. <laughs> Even after the Doctor has to kill the ship, Wilf still believes. He still expects the Doctor to have a plan, because that's who Wilf is. He's the loyal companion who never gives up, even in such a dire situation, which again is what makes him perfect. Because his loyalty and his heroism is ultimately what kills the Doctor by reminding him of what the right thing to do is. Wilf is also comparable to the Time Lord because of their shared past. They're both old soldiers, with Wilf having joined the war out of duty but never taken a life, in contrast to the Doctor, who had to end the Time War by killing trillions. It's a good parallel considering this story is all about that war. The Doctor having to take up arms side by side with Wilf, showing the significance of the narrative that even this pacifist has to return to his soldier-like ways. The Master is a strange part of this narrative, since he pretty much only exists as a misdirection, a villain there purely to be one-upped by the Time Lords. His very reintroduction itself is a plot contrivance, being resurrected through ridiculous Time Lord science. I like the idea of him having a cult, because we all know what politicians are like, but I think this resurrection scene is way too out there. Tell death. I'm sure there are a million ways to justify the Master's return, but I don't think this is the right one. And it turns out the cult aren't the only ones who wanted good old Harry Saxon back either, since when looking at a top 10 goblins caught on camera YouTube video, Naismith and his daughter noticed the Master running through the flames. This pair are weird villains with their creepy relationship. They kind of get lost in the bloat of the story, all they're here for is to introduce the Stargate they nicked from Tortured 1, which itself is actually a good piece of consistency, a realistic, lasting fallout from Doomsday. Usually you'd get some misguided scientist hoping to cure the world of all illness, but Naismith wants it solely to make his daughter immortal, despite that actually being the worst possible thing you could ever give someone. But hey, I guess they aren't exactly familiar with the intricacies of everlasting life. You know what? Maybe they should watch Doctor Who. Speaking of cursed immortality, the Master's resurrection went wrong, turning him into this hungry, skeletal supervillain. I love Davis's campiness, especially the Sim Master, but it's a bit much as he hams up the madness in an unintentionally goofy scene. It just kind of goes against the whole high stakes tone of the story, because this is meant to be the Tenth Doctor's darkest final hour and his biggest battle, but then you just get this. Between this and the wire, I'm starting to think it might be a bad idea to have your villain loudly state their hunger. I'm honestly not sure what they were going for with the Master being like this. I get that it makes sense with the Immortality Gate, giving him a motivation to hijack it, but he just kind of becomes Gollum. I think it's memorable though, for better or for worse, since it definitely leaves an impression. I also like the concept of his struggle for his sanity. In Series 3, he was just a psychopath, plain and simple, but now he can barely function. The hunger and the drums forcing him to the shell of a person. It's a really powerful concept, but I think they could have done a bit better with the actual execution of it. However, for all the flaws of the Master becoming Skeletor, there are a couple of wonderful moments between him and the Doctor. Since the whole story is a misdirect playing on Karma's prophecy to make you think the Master will be the death of the Doctor. One of these incredible scenes is the nighttime confrontation between the two Time Lords. It's almost like a western, an intense standoff with minimal sound design. Even the Master's Sith lightning powers don't detract from the epic atmosphere, although part of me wishes the Doctor died right then and there. That would have been a truly shocking twist. The scene also gives us hints towards their shared history. 
I always love getting these hints, especially because the Delgado Master was one of the last of that cycle. So I appreciate the glimpse here. We used to run across those fields all day, calling up at the sky. I especially adore the Doctor's terror as he realises the sound of drums is real after all. It makes him question everything he knew about the Master. All these years he thought it was the result of insanity, but now he understands it's actually the cause. The implications of that terrify him, because he knows, if only by instinct, that it's related to whatever is coming through the darkness. Before the Doctor can get through to the Master though, the villain is enlisted to fix the Immortality Gate, which belongs to the Vim Oh my lord, she's a cactus. Just as a side note, I can't help but feel like this whole Shimmer concept was a conscious decision by Davis to address the controversial Sathene. It's just a nagging feeling I have about the streamlined nature. However, I do love the penny drop as the Doctor works out the Master's plan. Indeed, he has reconfigured the medical template for humans, everyone on the planet transforming into the Master himself, including the world's most unconvincing Obama stand-in. It's the ultimate villainous act, since all the people the Doctor fights so hard for have become his biggest enemy. Such chilling irony, even if it is dripping with the exaggerated campiness of the Davis era. It's simply an adorably goofy scene. John see him hamming it up and you can tell he enjoyed doing it, as difficult as it was to film. They don't really do much with the concept in part 2 though, there's some interesting use of the fact he controls all the satellites and weapons, but the Master just kind of gets sidelined by the Time Lords. However, there is a good payoff to the scenes of the Doctor begging him to use his brilliant mind for good, since the Master redeems himself by attacking Rassilon. It almost makes him an anti-hero because he's not doing it to save the Doctor, he's doing it out of revenge on the Time Lords for infecting him with a Strombi. I feel like it's a good culmination of his own character journey as a villain without changing the character's morality. It's almost like the planned ending for Delgado's Master, sacrificing himself to save the Doctor without ever actually revealing his stance. The Master Race reveal isn't even the true cliffhanger, which is brilliant. All throughout the story there's been a mysterious narrator played by Timothy Dalton, who is definitely not a murderer. It's only at the end that the music ramps up with the biggest reveal of this entire era of the show, the Time Lords. Honestly, I absolutely adore this cliffhanger so much. It's so completely unexpected and chilling. This is an era that continuously built the Time Lords up as a legend, a lost myth the Doctor remembers with a mix of nostalgia and fear but can never reach because of the Time War, which has been a part of the show ever since the very beginning of Series 1. That's what makes this moment so unprecedented. Realistically, it's the only way for Davis to up the ante after all the previous finale threats. The only way to keep increasing the stakes would be to do the impossible and bring back the Time Lords themselves. So I just adore this reveal. It builds to it perfectly with one of Marigold's best scores. This is how you end the first part of a special named The End of Time. Because what else could the Time Lords return in tale? Part 2 wastes no time picking up its cliffhanger, with that fantastic visual of a burning Gallifrey on the final day of the Time War. Such a sharp contrast to the beauty we saw in the sound of drums. It just shows you how far this race has fallen with this massive war. Also, I love Dalton as Rassilon. He perfectly conveys the insanity and desperation of the famous Time Lord, striking down anyone who opposes him. If you're going to have the entire Time Lord race as a climactic villain, who better to lead them than the apparent founder of the whole society? The one who unlocked the secrets of time travel to begin with, and also he has great spittle too. It turns out the Master's Drumbeat is actually the heartbeat of a Time Lord, which Rassilon sent back through the Vortex to create a tether to the Master, which when combined with a white point star allows the Time Lords to bypass the Time Lord. I think it's good that the drumbeat becomes narratively important, not just flavour text for the Master's insanity in the previous story. It shows just how much of a long game this has been. The Time Lords have set this up through the course of the Master's entire life because it began the very first time you looked into the Untempest Schism, so it really shows their strength as a villain. Also, the Doctor's reaction to the White Point Star is incredible. He immediately knows it can only come from Gallifrey, which shakes him to his core. It speaks volumes about his opinion of them and that now he takes Wolf's gun. That's how big this moment is, that this ultra pacifist fears his own people so much that he'd actually arm himself against them. Remember, these are the Time Lords from the final day of the Time War. They're now warriors, hell bent on conquering and destroying. It's basically a planet full of the Time Lord Victorious, so you immediately feel the pit in your stomach and realise just how dangerous they are. The Doctor was there in the war and watched the species twisting and perverting first hand, so you more than understand his fear. 
using the drum beat, the Time Lords return to the galaxy through the game. Dalton once again chewing the scenery as Rassilon easily squashes the Master's plan of transplanting himself into every Time Lord. I think it quickly shows the extent of Rassilon's strength, he can simply reverse it all with his Torchwood Resurrection Glove. Remember, he is THE Time Lord, the biggest and most powerful of them all, so I think it does a good job showing him as a bigger villain than the Master could ever be. Indeed, Gallifrey itself is returning, not just the people, but the planet itself. How can the stakes possibly get bigger than this? It's like the Stolen Earth, but even more extreme, as the Doctor lists off all the horrific beings and weapons created in the latter days, which are now about to come flooding in. This is a fantastic moment that reminds you of Davis's cosmic horror vision of the war. He has always been a talented writer for world building, with all these mystical and fantastical names and places, but there's something extra chilling about memorable names like the Scarrow Degradation and the Nightmare Child. They mean absolutely nothing, but the context adds so much weight and terror to them. It just amazes me that Davis was able to up the ante for a third time in this story alone. First it was the Master Race, then it was the Time Lords, and now it's the Time War itself returning. All throughout this era of the show we have been told how devastating and traumatic the war was. The reveal is so significant because of that context, so it really helps deliver the promise of the ultimate showdown with the highest stakes of any episode, since Rassilon wants to enact the final destruction of time itself, completely destroying the entirety of reality as a result. The story culminates in the ultimate standoff, the Master desperate to join the Time Lords whilst Rassilon is seeking to destroy time itself, with the Doctor stuck in the middle. I kind of wish they had had a single throwaway line earlier saying there was only one bullet in the gun, since that would make this even more dramatic. Instead it just makes this goofy cocking sound every time he changes his target, which is very silly. But when it comes down to it, this moment is what his entire incarnation has been leading up to. He had refused to take up arms because it's not the Doctor's way, but now he has to face this huge challenge to both his identity and his morality. Rassilon puts it best when he says, The final act of your life is murder. The Doctor can't hide from this anymore, he has to stand and fight, which really shows the severity of the situation. However, Wolf has been seeing a mysterious woman throughout the narrative, who may or may not be the Doctor's mother, Susan, Romana or Clara, depending on which fan theory you subscribe to. It's great that the Doctor sees her now, because it immediately reminds him this isn't who he is. To the Doctor, there is always another, non-violent solution. He just didn't realise it because he was so consumed by this huge battle and his impending death. So instead of using Wolf's gun for murder, he shoots a console which breaks the immortality gate, sending the Time Lords back to Gallifrey and saving Earth. It's a really strong and powerful climax, perfectly balancing high cosmic stakes with deeply personal ones to round off the Doctor's struggle. Back into the Time War, Rassilon! Back into hell! One of the central focuses of the end of time is consequence. The last time we saw the Doctor, he had gone against all his rules and morality to become the Time Lord Victorious, altering fixed points in time. As a viewer, we know such actions can only result in the most severe consequences, because, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. This is immediately obvious at the beginning of End of Time, with a foreboding prologue, along with the Doctor's detour actually setting in motion the events. In the promotion of the special, we were being told every twist and turn in the Tenth Doctor's tragic life has all been leading up to this. It's what makes it so triumphant when he finally vanquishes evil and realises he has avoided his fate. But then there's the chilling subversion as Wolf starts knocking, four times. This change in tone is perfectly done. The moment of realisation on the Doctor's face says it all, that defeated look of the prophecy coming true. A lot of people really don't like the scene, but I love it. The Doctor is still very much the Time Lord Victorious at this point. Man, exactly, look at you. Not remotely important. He still hasn't properly faced the consequences of his actions in Waters of Mars, where he had saved three people whose deaths were fixed points in time, yet it was Adelaide who died to preserve the timeline. Now, the consequences have caught up to the Doctor, giving him this choice. Does he continue on this path of power and glory, or does he do the right thing, like every other incarnation would have done? That's why I like how out of character his selfish outburst is. It's not how the Doctor should act, and that's kind of the point. He's fallen so far by playing God that he needs a humbling moment to realise how lost he has become, so it's the perfect way for him to die. He doesn't go out in a blaze of glory as the triumphant hero because he doesn't deserve it. 
Instead, he sacrificed himself to save one simple, unremarkable life. That's who the Doctor is. He has let so many other people die for him, but this time he bears the responsibility himself. I just think it's a really powerful payoff to this very long character journey. A lot of people find it too sudden, but I think the signs were always there. He is slowly being growing more prideful and self-absorbed over his entire era, so this is a way to bring him back down to earth and reconnect to that core of the character. Wilfred. It's my honour. A lot of people dislike the 10th Doctor's farewell tour, but I think it's the perfect way to close out this era of the show spanning five years. They throw in as many iconic monsters as they can, just trying to send a love letter to such a colourful and popular era. Even the music in the entire special was like a victory lap. Epic variations of scores we already know and love, and the music itself plays a big part in the epilogue, especially with Vale. But when you really look at it, the goodbye to the characters and the actors is simply because there was no expectation for them to ever be used again. So it's nice to see what happened to them, like Martha and Mickey marrying and becoming freelance after the dissolution of Tortured 3. I honestly find it quite distasteful that a lot of people pull the race card here, because they happen to be the only two black companions up until this point. There's actual character justification though, since they are both companions treated by the Doctor as though they were second best. With them going on to work together in Torchwood, they can't have normal relationships anymore, and they just so happen to be the only two easily pairable single characters. So their race really doesn't have anything to do with it. And sure, Davis probably did it for a Smith and Jones joke, but there is actual character-based reason for them being together, so what's the big deal? It's all just a sweet send-off to these cornerstones of the era, even if I do hate that this single line wrecks the entire timeline of the Davis era, because of the Aliens of London time skip. 2005, January the 1st. At least they found a non-intrusive way to incorporate Rose, given the whole trapped on a parallel universe thing and all that jazz. After all, she's the most iconic companion of the revival, so you can't exactly leave her out here. But hey, at least the counterbalance is Donna winning the lottery. And don't lie, Wolf Salute always makes everyone tear up. A lot of real emotion there as it sinks in that this is the end of the line. The actual regeneration itself is also quite contentious, many people seeing it as too overly dramatic and final, making it harder for Moffat to pick the show up. But you need to see it from a casual audience's point of view. For any other show, this would be the final episode, so they needed to treat it as such. At the end of the day, this is 21st century television drama. It has to feel suitably final, otherwise the viewer will feel cheated. So I think it does that well through the farewell tour and destruction of the TARDIS. Davis wasn't trying to sabotage his successor, he was just trying to deliver a gratifying ending to his five years of Doctor Who. It's not just the Doctor changing, it's the showrunner and pretty much the whole production team. Take off your jaded and cynical Doctor Who fan hat and just remember how hard hitting this simple line was when you were a kid. I don't want to go. You can accuse it of handicapping the successors all you want, but there is truth to the line because David Tennant was a childhood fan. This was his dream role and that's it for him now, so it understandably makes you want to cry. The sequence is able to have its cake and eat it too, simultaneously giving the Doctor a character-based death and a huge dramatic regeneration, with Vale de Shem a beautiful piece of music, literally meaning Farewell 10. I just consider it the perfect farewell to this era. And besides, Moffat and Smith immediately stole the show anyway, with that fun post-regeneration sequence garnering complaints with this line. Uh, and still not ginger. Trust Moffat to cause an outrage within his first two minutes of being a showrunner. When it comes to the end of time, it's important to remember just how much it needed to wrap up. There was a lot to juggle. When you have as many moving parts as this story has, there are bound to be some dysfunctional elements. However, it's clear that the benefits more than outweigh the flaws. Really, the only downside of the end of time is the Skeletor Master, which is unnecessarily goofy. For every Skeletor Master though, there are so many phenomenal scenes to counterbalance it. I also think people are wrong to be so heavily critical of the treatment of regeneration. It's a brand new exploration, much more fitting for the era of television. Treating it like death is what makes the Doctor so compelling in this narrative, with his introspective character journey, along with it being a gratifying and memorable farewell to the entire Russell T Davis era of the show. It has all the campiness and drama you'd expect, also celebrating how far the show has come, thanks to impressive set pieces which could have never happened in 2005. 
David Tennant puts in one of his best performances, sharing some truly memorable scenes with the always wonderful Bernard Cribbins. Honestly, it's no worse than any other Davis era finale, encountering the same issues those all face like Deus Ex Machina's galore. It's just a phenomenal climax seeing the shocking return of the Time Lords to pay off their ongoing presence throughout the series as a myth. The music is absolutely incredible and the final moments truly memorable for every Doctor Who fan. I genuinely think a lot of people over exaggerate just how bad the story is based on a few small flaws early on in the story. It does everything it needs to do to wrap up an entire revolutionary era of the show, so of course it would have had to have taken some risks along the way. There's simply no easy way to satisfy everyone with so much riding on it. After all, I don't want to go. And I'd like to thank my platinum level patron Fallon Cortez and all my gold level patrons Alex Marston, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Franz Horn aka Line Vortex, George, Herna Verzog, James Aleya Waterhouse, John, and Stefan Never Miller. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs>